Please get ready for our panel discussion uh, with Abhi Mukherjee, Senior Economist Amazon, Ching Wu, Director of Econometrics at Google, Tilman Drurup, a Director of Machine Learning Engineering, and Wei Jing Zhan, Tech Lead at Ecosystem Data Science, as they share their triumphs and challenges in navigating uh, the causal AI space, and moderated by Causal Lenses Associate Director and Head of Partnerships, Alfonso. Awesome, thank you, Daniel. Um, should we start by doing a quick round of introductions? So do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, sure, hi everyone, my name is Wen Jin. I'm a principal data scientist at Roblox and I lead our ecosystem data science team. Currently, we own the analytics of our centralized experimentation platform, but our team is also in the process of really scaling that into a comprehensive insights platform on bringing different causal models, forecasting, root cost analysis and analytics tools in a, in a way that we can support a diverse set of users, not just technical data scientists, but also, I mean, the goal is also to have more of a self-service um, PM stakeholder facing uh, interface as well. Awesome, thank you. Hey, I'm Tillman. I'm machine learning director of machine learning engineering at Instacart, um, economist by training, and I lead the economics team at Instacart that supports horizontally all parts of the company. I could talk a long time about the stuff that we work on, but I'll skip that, so please hit me up later if you're interested. Also, I'm hiring. <laughs> uh, uh, this is Ching. Um, I'm, the, I'm in charge of the team called e Econometrics. We report to our chief economist and also reports to our president directly. So given how large the company is, you know, we are pretty lucky to sit on top of every PAs. Uh, we kind of pitch our consulting services and also tools and the methods to anyone who wants to use our methods. And yeah, we primarily focus on causal inferences, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Api, uh, nice to see everyone here. Um, I work at Amazon on the economic valuation and optimization team, which uh, as the name suggests, works on valuation and optimization. Um, yeah, I can also go into a lot of depth around like what our team does and like how we work with Amazon, but uh, let me stop there. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I guess we can start with an open question, which is what motivated each of you to focus on causality and causal inference methods? Um, my background is actually in biostatistics and public health. I did my training across the Bay at UC Berkeley on biostatistics, and most of my research um, in, in, the, in my PhD program and postdoc was on public health and precision medicine, and also on HIV prevention. So a lot of things that Maher talked about um, on chronic care treatment uh, was very, resonated very much with me. So from there, um, in, in those applications, really not everything can be A-B tested, and a lot of times, even if you want to a B test something um, to generate some hypothesis and candidates to test. You do need the observational causal inference to do that. And even within A B test, right? It's not like once you can test, then everything is golden. There are still questions of how do you extrapolate into longer term effects? How do you understand um, treatment effect heterogeneity um, or causal pathway through mediation analysis? So there are a lot of questions here that you just need to have um, where causal inference comes in. Sure, I can try. So I'm an economist by training, so as an economist, I'm naturally interested not only in understanding how the things are the way they are, but also in understanding how things could be if we change the state of the world a little bit. So we've been working a lot on questions like pricing, incentives, and so on, and all of those are intric intricately linked to causality in some way or another. So, you know, that led me to it, and it's been an exciting field, so, um, yeah. Uh, ultimately, I think we're trying to help the decision makers to make the right decisions, and these decisions have a lot to do with like the causal uh, impacts and also the program evaluation and policy qualities and all that stuff. That, that I, think, I think that's sort of ultimately, um, you know, inspire us to do more like um, both like experiment and observation studies to provide the uh, the leaders uh, to make the right decisions. Yeah. Uh, I also come from an economics background, um, so it kind of, the, the empirical aspect of the field really revolves around causal inference. Um, so I started with kind of more reduced form traditional approaches and from there machine learning and applications of machine learning and deep learning to those uh, problem spaces. Um, yeah, so I think similar to Tillman in terms of background. Awesome. 
So, um, Wenjing, no, not many data science teams have experiment, experimented with causal inference um, before. How do you recommend they go about kind of building this uh, practice internally and, and getting internal buy-in from, from senior stakeholders? Yeah, I think it really depends on where the data science journey is in each company. But I mean, obviously a lot of companies start with having analytics function just surfacing very basic base business intelligence and then they graduate into having an experimentation platform. And then inevitably, there are business questions where you cannot be answered by, causal, uh, by experimentation. So that's where observational causal inference come in. But I think across all these different um, steps of that journey, no matter what stage you are, the strategy is really just that two prong show value and very cleverly demonstrate and communicate value. When I say show value, it's working, having, I mean, data scientists need to have, right, we're not just um, here to code up a problem, right? We have to have very deep contacts with the, with the business, really be able to understand what are the key dry questions that the business needs to answer, and then find opportunities where we can show some, where we can answer those. Um, let me just give a very concrete example, right? So we want to know what are, what are the drivers of churn in a Roblox system. You could be, you can run, run, run some pilot project to using observational causal inference to identify some, some potential drivers, and then from those, rank those drivers, and then develop some tests that you can, you can validate this hypothesis. So when, when we say, right, how do you, the value is answering the questions through actionable insight. What is actionable insights? Like, be more concrete is something that you can test with a product, like I, that, something that I can come up with a product lever, a product feature that we can test on. So this is one way we can showcase value through pilot projects and then have many iteration of those, but also be very, um, be a bit, in terms of how you communicate these insights, and you need to be able to talk at audience at different levels. Your data scientists need to be trained to not just go deep in the technical details, but also be able to zoom out and talk to your non-technical um, stakeholders in a way that is more business focused, where they can understand the intuition behind the methods, but more importantly, the implications of these insights. Um, yeah, so I think, so that's the um, showcasing and communicating some of the values. And then the other part, it's also that continuous culture shift to know that we are not advocating, this is not like, experimentation is not a smoking gun. Causal observation not, is not a smoking gun either. It's not one versus the other method. It's really about the company continuously building out a diverse set of toolkits Right, to have a body of evidence. You, you sometimes don't really have a concrete 95% confidence interval static um, treatment effect, right? But it's really, okay, maybe with 80% confidence interval, we have a directional read. That is good enough for us to inform the, the product to move in one direction versus the other. So it's, um, it's communicating that tool set diversity that companies should have. Anyone want to add to that? Um, like Google has been running online experiments for a very, very long time. So on the product engineer side, the experiments has been their like um, golden standard. But on the business side, right, I'm talking about sales, marketing. Uh, early on, my colleague actually presented like, you know, what they were doing in the GCS sales side. So the business side uh, at this moment, you know, they're not fully aware of the cause of inferences of how the power of it because most leaders, you know, grew up in the, sort of older days, and they're just not aware of how they make decisions. Underneath that decision is actually a lot of causal inferences behind the scene. So we are trying really hard to sell our technology and our methods to them. Also part of our job is to educate them, to make them aware that you can take advantage other types of experiments, all observational data, all natural shocks, and quasi experiments to really get better insights before you make the final decisions. So that's definitely, I think it's not, it has been not uh, hasn't been that easy, as I said. Like I think uh, this is ongoing work, and I think that there's a recently there's a lot that's a trend of uh, tech firms hiring economists, right? People ask why they're hiring them. I think that's because economists have been you know 
borrowing the tools, you know, um, from the public policy side and program evaluation side, you know, and push them over to the corporate setting and make the business business leaders to make the right decisions. So I think that's a ongoing trend. Uh, we are kind of riding that trend, and hopefully, you know, more teams, more PAs will like uh, embrace uh, these uh, these methods and the processes. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing I'd add to that is part of the challenge is that there is fundamentally no source of ground truth in a lot of these problems, particularly when you're looking at observational causal models. Um, and so, like, like I think Amazon and most tech companies have been doing A-B testing for a very long time. That space is pretty intuitive. But when you think of, like, more obscure problems that can be framed in causal terms, it comes down a lot to sort of advocating and communicating and explaining how exactly something would, would in fact, be a good way to think about making decisions. Um, like what I've experienced is that like once you kind of do a few of these, like the initial ones are pretty hard. Like you're kind of really, really, really struggling to look for like a problem space where where these things are applicable and valuable. But once you've done that, like at least in the big companies, the I think what en what ends up happening is that more and more people get interested, more and more people see this as like something that that would help them sort of optimize for their own business processes. And I think that's kind of how it goes. Yeah. You guys got some of the most famous people. <laughs> we try, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that, that ties in quite well to my question to you, Tillman, which is what, what are some of those challenges that you, that you have seen when uh, adopting this journey? So at the risk of being a bit confrontational, I think the modeling part is typically fairly easy. Like setting up a model, running an experiment, it's not trivial, obviously. There's a lot of hard work and good work going into this. But I've seen a lot of models or causal approaches fail silently once the model is tested and rolled out. Because typically models turn into orphans, in particular causal models, once you roll them out. There's nobody watching them. Nobody makes sure that whatever your causal estimate is, is once it's rolled out in production, stays true in, in some way. So building this muscle that you build a causal model, an optimization framework on top, roll it out, and then keep check of what's happening once it's in production, that there are no emergent phenomena, that there's nothing else happening. I mean, your product is evolving all the time. So your causal estimates are evolving all the time. I've seen this on multiple occasions, particularly when the roles between data scientists and MLEs are not entirely clear, that models, they don't get abandoned. They live their life out there in, in the world, but nobody's really looking at them. And I've seen a lot of projects fail in this way. So um, I don't know whether others have seen similar effects, but that's something that repeatedly shows up. You run an experiment, the experiment looks great, you roll it out, and there's no plan for after. Yeah, I think even we we have experiment rollouts and then we run internal holdouts after that. But we have like six months, year holdout depending on the team. And oftentimes what you see in the holdouts do not necessarily um, capture the things that you see in the experiments. And that's always a challenge, right? It's one around whether our test conditions actually reflect what happens in a while. And then the other one, I think, also comes back to um, some of the things that we talked about earlier is, so you, your experiments, even analysis, happen in a short period of time, one week, a few weeks of an experiment. But the underlying question that we're interested in actually long term, so how do we do that extrapolation? Right, That's also one of those causal questions that we don't really have a good ground truth on. Just to add to that, so we have found that probabilistic decision-making um, helps us a lot in keeping this in check. So not only running a holdout, but making sure that we perpetually generate new training data so we can re-roll and evaluate different kinds of models as sort of the product evolves. So we can, using this kind of framework, we can always keep track of how a model is performing right now. And we can use the same data to train new models based on updated data and evaluate, you know, off policy evaluate different kinds of models and how they would work. It raises the bar on the technical side quite a bit, and it requires you to convince stakeholders that you, you know, even after an experiment has been run, you kind of want to waste a little bit of money all the time to generate more and better data. This has been something that you know, took some convincing that this is worthwhile, but um, we found that it's definitely worth it, and blog posts coming out on that topic soon. Yeah, we just had a long sort of internal discussion based on uh, Angus Deaton actually came to Google and gave us a talk. He has a very famous a paper about like the, you know, he has a lot of reservations about RCT. And internally, we also have seen a lot of these RCT results. Um, you know, sometimes 
don't seem to make sense over the time. So there's a lot of you know limitations about RCT, you know, A/B test. Um, there's various different strategies to sort of mitigate its uh, how to say potential harm, or just take advantage of it's whatever is the best. So uh, I think it's still ongoing debates, you know, all these uh, different strategies or methods are out there to make sure, you know, RCT is still run, but make sure the results are used uh, properly, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, one other challenge is even if you have like the holdout samples and all that stuff, one of the challenges comes down to backward compatibility of methods. Uh, so as the field is evolving, like methods are improving, methods are evolving, and none of them are perfect. You are making assumptions, you're introducing some subtle biases that are not always easily apparent. Um, and then when you have a business stakeholder who's already been using your causal estimates, particularly for like large decisions, and now you've rolled out a model where things have started to change, and it's not always easy for you to say, you know, it's changing because of X or Y or Z. Um, I think that also makes it uh, difficult to build confidence sometimes. Um, yeah. And um, Abby, what are some of the kind of areas where you've been applying causal inference to and some of the most successful use cases you have seen? Sure. Uh, so I work primarily with observational models, as I said. Uh, we kind of view it as uh, um, like structural causal modeling, really. Uh, so it's sort of like we specify a dynamic graph structure, and then we think about counterfactuals, which can be constructed by removing sort of nodes or sets of relationships there. Um, and so we apply that pretty flexibly to a lot of different areas. I think some of the ones that have probably been major areas of focus that we've sort of uh, seen a lot of interest in have to do with valuing product lines, valuing product launches, uh, marketing applications in terms of, uh, you know, like our investments worth it uh, for the company. Um, so I think that's kind of the space that we've been in, and now we're kind of looking into going more granular there and helping with optimization problems around, like, what should you even be doing going forward, like, when it's not, when it's not even a clearly framed question. Um, what about the, the rest of you, similar areas or any? I think we've been fairly successful in applying causal inference, in particular heterogeneous treatment effect estimation for areas like incentives and personalized targeting and so on. Um, it's fairly standard. We're also fairly excited about the potential in paid marketing where we're operating with bandits. Um, have some cool stuff happening there and it's proven extremely impactful. Um, yeah, anything? Yeah. I think we have a few success stories around, um, what I alluded to earlier, the hypothesis generation is um, identifying potential. So it's we are in the process of building out really a metric hierarchy or some very coarse understanding of what the business tag will look like. Right. So here is a company North Star, with the next layer of direct drivers and then the next layer of drivers of those. Um, so in order to validate those, we try to identify some kind of encouragement A-B test that can help us move some of those drivers. And in some, we are seeing some success stories um, uh, of some of these drivers and relationships being val um, uh, confirmed with, with this encouragement A-B test. But there are some others that is just, um, we haven't been able to, right, because the confidence interval was too wide in the original analysis. Oh, similarly, in the IV analysis, that we can really have any definitive answers. Uh, we are trying to move beyond just the binary treatment at this moment because we're moving towards the continuous repeated treatments. Uh, also, like I think Mahir described, like in his organization, they, you know, the his clients or his advertisers are just like patients, needs a continuous dosage of treatment. It's also a multi, it's a vector, it's not even just uh, one number. So these are much harder problems. Um, and also imagine if you want to get some confidence, uh, it really needs a lot of data. Uh, but also we think uh, these type of problem definitely is very uh, important for uh, operation in the company, like such as, you know, how do you allocate resources uh, properly across different PAs? How do you, um, you know, um, optimize your operations for your your clients or your users? Um, I, I personally feel that space right now is still um, not as explored as the binary treatment world. So it is definitely uh, very challenging given the small size of data and also the uh, the noise out there, yeah. Awesome. And um, uh, well, 
you're a, lot, a, lot, a few of you are economists, but um, Ching, how have you seen the, the emergence of machine learning kind of impact traditional econometrics techniques? And, um, uh, yes, definitely. Um, but uh, I think in a lot of our business problems, definitely we're suffering two things, right? right number one, the uh, measurements are not accurate. It's not, yet, it's not accurate. Uh, lots of lots of missing variables. I think because of those uh, problems, you know, like uh, machine learning can help, but it's very limited, right? Because you we just don't have enough signals. Um, so we actually find out a lot of these uh, traditional difference and difference synthetic control uh, or RD methods actually work reasonably well because they don't require a lot of covariates. Uh, so that's that's what it is. But in the space, we have a lot more signals. Um, we definitely will try to use ML quite a bit. You know, in you know, using either double ML or BART model or you know, sort of you know, double robustness. You know, you know, like propensity scores. Definitely, uh, we, we use them if we have enough covariates. But in the situation that's really hard to collect them, we kind of have to resort back to the more sort of traditional uh, econometric models, yeah. Uh, I think uh, in tech, at least, like there, there is a lot of, I guess, talent and expertise in machine learning that, that becomes useful. And at some point, it becomes optimal for the company also to think about, like, would this machine learning engineer be optimally invested in improving a predictive algorithm by like 0.01% or should we kind of think about trying to integrate it into a causal estimate that might be more valuable? Um, I think the field of economics is generally a little bit slower to adopt new methodologies. One of the reasons why the traditional ones have been so successful is because they've been so well used and so well studied. Um, but I am seeing that's kind of changing. Like there is definitely more interest even in academia in terms of, integra in, in terms of int introducing new machine learning based methods in, in, in kind of uh, more traditional problem space, yeah. Awesome. Um, I guess the, well, it's, it's an AI conference and everyone's thinking about uh, Gen AI nowadays. Um, it's top of mind for, for many executives. Um, have you seen it impact uh, your causal journey and have you thought about kind of interfaces between uh, generative models and, and, and your causal models or ways of uh, leveraging both together? So I guess, um, let's see, what can I talk about? Um, I think what we found is there's a lot of world knowledge embedded in these large language models that can feed us input to other causal models. We, like all the attempts I've personally done at using LLMs for causal inference type scenarios have failed, like from the LLM self-confounding or making nonsensical recommendations. So, you know, plain vanilla LLMs haven't done it for me. However, what LLMs can produce in terms of structured knowledge about the world has proven fairly impactful. Um, you know, at, at Instacart, we work with tons and tons of catalog data. And if you ask it questions about certain parts of the catalog, how they relate to each other, you often get extremely good responses. Like, as an economist, I'm obviously interested in things like, you know, which of these things are complements and substitutes. And you ask it for huge matrices, and you look at a few entries, and you realize, oh, this is flawless. So that's what I found pretty impressive. That doesn't really solve the causal problem, but it can serve as an input for causal problems where you need a lot of covariates, for example, to describe differences between products and so on. Um, anything on? Yeah, I think to add to that, um, for me, so far, where I see the most, um, like, the, our highest ROI is in that my productivity boost and also in terms of feature engineering. But to actually... Um, deepen like the causal structure, like being able to form a causal structure, causal understanding of an ecosystem. I, I feel that's really the the Christmas wish list, but we're still quite far from that. Yeah, I think it depends on the type of problem that's being asked. Uh, in our world, a lot of these impacts are like in the range of one to two percent, and with pretty large variance. So. Yeah, I, I personally, we probably used LIM to brainstorm a little bit, but when it comes down to actual estimation and evaluation, you know, I haven't found it that useful at all. 
I'd say it's uh, still early days also. Um, it's difficult to, it's it, like the generative model structure, the transformers and things like that. Like as far as a predictive tool goes, I don't know if that's where the real value is and the generative construct really is not applicable directly to the causal space. Um, I think what's actually interesting is the inverse of your question. Like what happens when you think about causal structure added to, a, to an LLM to understand like does it even make sense? Like how should it think about what is a good thing to be saying in that context and why is it even saying that? Um, so I think that's probably more in the machine learning domain, not so much maybe in the causal space. But uh, I think that's something that, that would be interesting and there is work going on there. So. Yeah, sort of like uh, grounding the, the LLM on the, on the causal model itself, exactly. right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I guess on, on that note, what are some of the areas in, in the field of causal inference that you're most excited about? Um, any new research or...? So what I like is not so much... Uh, it's not so much new developments as there have been things that have been used for very long and now people are going into them and saying, okay, wait, are these assumptions sensible? Like, what, are we, what does this estimate really mean? Is it an average effect? Is it an average effect on the treated and so on? So, like, uh, we mentioned diff and diffs a little while ago. And so, like, one of those things like, that it's a few years old now, but, like, there was this paper which kind of shows that, like, essentially 30 years of research has been interpreting a causal estimate as slightly differently than, you know, what it really should be and, like, how should you actually be running this, particularly when you have, like, repeated treatments. Um, so I like some of the I like the fact that like there's people who are sort of spending a lot of time reviewing things that have take have been taken almost for granted and like how how can we improve these? Um, so that's something that I find pretty interesting. Yeah, I want to echo that as well. I think causal inference is has been a, around for a long time in a lot of fields outside of tech, right? Social sciences, health sciences, and and even things that we use a lot in medicine, like time varying confounding. It, when I first got into tech, that like everyone was very focused on point treatment, continuous point treatment, or binary point treatment. So even he, like now we have software packages in I know EconML has that right. Just ha hearing all this um, like the discussion is now go moving beyond how can we best understand point treatment to how can we best model time varying confounding. Um, so that's I think is. That's an example of um, the knowledge from different fields now start to propagate across the different tech uh, companies. And that is really what, what helps us cross-pollinate and have more ideas generated and build on top of those. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think academically, I've seen a lot of uh, new things out there right now, right? Um, the, the missing variable problem, the, the Bayesian version of everything. And there's a sort of resurgence of the difference in difference. You know, there's a lot of new take on difference in difference and heterogeneity of like uh, impact, you know, like the causal tree and BART, everything out there, uh, fast BART. Um, yeah, I think, uh, and I, was, I mentioned earlier, the, the, the continuous treatment, the, the, the dosage or the vector treatment. So I think, yeah, the academia is continuing to um, push this whole forward and, you know, in the industry, you know, some of the problems probably are inspired by, by the industry problems. Because I know, you know, um, Dito spent a lot of time and Susan Athi also spent a lot of time in, in Amazon and, and everybody else. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of their research were inspired by the real problems they confronted there. So, yeah, um, the, the, our job is actually sort of um, bringing all of them together, right, so that we can also use the data, use the methods to solve our real problems, yeah. Can I also be a contrarian here a little bit after saying, oh, I just said. Um, so we talk about things that we're excited about. Uh, one thing that I still see gap on is the gap between really cutting edge methodology research in academia and how that is implemented, how that gets um, uh, how that is brought into the industry. Usually it takes a long time, right? All these things that we just talked about that we're currently excited in, they were developed years ago. So why did it take so long? And how can we accelerate that so that the next batch, the new batch of result, um, research can be implemented in shorter time frame, shorter and shorter time frame going forward? It feels like where is that gap and how can we close it? I, I, I don't know. I'm, I think I do. So I, I think we found a fairly good way of getting fresh research ideas into the company. So every year when the economic job market happens, we go around and invite people who go onto the job market to present to our internal econ seminar. 
So um, they can be grilled by 15 to 20 machine learning engineers and economists. And we found this is a very, very rich exchange. We provide them with insights as to what the industry cares about, what the actual problems are, and we get from them a perspective on what's up to date in, in the industry as well. Um, as to the topics that I'm very interested in, because you mentioned Susan's work, we work a lot on surrogates and contextual bandits. I think it's fairly advanced and it's a lot of fun just kind of following what the literature is doing and taking it directly to practice. It's not trivial, but um, yeah, something I'm passionate about. I think there, like I was thinking about like why things move slowly. Um, I think part of it is like in predictive models, there's like very clear measures, right? Like algorithm A is objectively better on like these dimensions. Like, I don't know, it's, it's, I think it's more challenging to frame. Like, how do you know that this latest paper from yeah. Professor X is actually better than what, whatever you've been using? Like, how do you even know that? Uh, yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I think there are some questions from the audience. Um, so. So there's a few come through. Nice, easy one to start you with. Uh, so with AI, machine learning, and LLMs increasingly being in the general public discourse, do you find that it's easier or harder to talk about the value of causal AI to your business stakeholders? I can take a stab at that. I think the challenge is now, if you don't have the word, L if you don't have the letters LLM somewhere in it, no one is interested. <laughs> So, I don't know, it's, it's facetious, but I think it, it is a problem. Like, I think uh, the expectation of uh, using the latest, almost, I'd say, fad technology in every single application, no matter how poorly suited it might be, I think that becomes like almost like a, it's almost like a point of contention now between the person who's going to use it and the person who's developing it. Um, yeah, so I think that's a bit of a challenge. Actually, I find it easier to sell right now. I brand Arima as AI forecast. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, definitely. I did notice a change in branding from it used to be statistics and then causal inference and then causal ML and now it's causal AI. Um, so let's see. I don't know what what that next uh, next uh, keyword is going to be, but I guess at least in in, in my case, um, there hasn't been a mixture or a conflation between Gen AI and causal inference, at least if, with my stakeholders. They very, um, maybe because the way how we use Gen AI in Cyro blocks is very much around content generation. So the, 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 like, this, the expectation hasn't changed on what causal AI can do. So, but still we have to continue. For us, it's more around the expectation between causal AI and experimentation and how to distinguish the quality of the evidence between the two. So that's continuing our problem, still our problem. Right, thank you. So uh, another one, nice easy one for you. Do you use causal discovery in any of your work? If so, why? And if not, why not? <laughs> Um, not regularly. Uh, there are specific cases where we do think about discovery, but in general, certain types of causal links are expected, at least in the problem spaces I've been looking at. They're kind of, you kind of know like what, what associations are not going to be useful and what are, and we can usually scale enough to try to allow for all of these, and then it's more of a question of like, do they actually bear out in terms of the association? But I think discovery is not something that I've worked with too much. Yeah, it doesn't work that much in our business sort of context because actually the causal relationships, uh, it's very complex. You know, sometimes it's really hard for us even to tell is A cost and B or is B cost A cost the C or some reverse relationship. So I think we we do a lot of homework just to understand the business, uh, understand all the associate sort of, you know, links to really get that causal picture right. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's an LIM model will work. It's, it's a lot of field study and sort of an uh, investigation with the stakeholders, yeah. Yeah, well, we haven't gotten to it either yet. So I think our product is still changing quite rapidly and a lot of the causal links that might exist today will probably not exist in the near future. Um, maybe at a future point in time we will. Yeah, same here. Yeah, it's very much about having a very concrete hypothesis and really testing those local links. All right, I'm picking out the questions that are more generally for the panel. There are a few that have 
being directed to individuals, but maybe we'll pick up on that in one of the breaks. But a question here, how do you see the connection between the econometric and data science teams within a causal inference perspective? I don't know whether that's whether the teams work together well or not, or what the question's for. <laughs> Um, so Amazon has very conveniently completely split them. So there are, there are economists and there are data scientists and they do, they do slightly different things. Um, I haven't found it to be a problem working with people with different backgrounds. I feel like in the causal space at least there's enough, uh, there's enough work to go around in terms of like, you know, like specializing maybe in the methods versus specializing in implementation side or specializing on the machine learning aspect of things. Um, so I think, like at least in my experience, it, it generally gels pretty well. Um, I haven't seen any instances of that causing frictions or inefficiencies. Yeah, and I think same here. So I've always been in the data science team, but then we don't really have a separate economy. We have economy data science team, and there are economists there, but then we also have economists just throughout the whole data science team. I think it's Data science is such a broad umbrella, right? Economist is one one type of data scientist, but in terms of, yeah, I never had any problem working with, I'm very surprised by that question, actually. Uh, yeah, um, you know, Google actually has tradition to hire a lot of statisticians. The hiring econ people is relatively new. Uh, we do think like uh, econometricians actually provide something very complementary. Um, so each side, you know, have something, you know, new, to bring to the table. So I, I feel like uh, the best strategy it is have both. And um, I, I think like econ people here tend to think a lot more about like incentives and um, you know unintended consequences and spell every fact. Uh, stats people tend to be a little bit more focused on the p-value. Um, okay, a hypothesis <laughs> testing. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pin it down. Anyway, just saying like I think both sides can collaborate, um, you know, um, be complementary by each other. Yeah. I think we'll wrap it up at that one. That was a good one. So thank you all.